1 John 5, 1 to 12. Whosoever believeth that Jesus is the Christ is born of God, and every one that loveth him that begat loveth him also that is begotten of him. By this we know that we love the children of God, when we love God and keep his commandments. For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not grievous. For whatsoever is born of God overcomes the world, and this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. Who is he that overcometh the world? But he that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God. This is he that came by water and blood, even Jesus Christ, not by water only, but by water and blood. And it is the Spirit that beareth witness, because the Spirit is truth. For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. And there are three that bear witness in earth, the Spirit, and the water, and the blood, and these three agree in one. If we receive the witness of men, the witness of God is greater. For this is the witness of God, which he hath testified of his Son. He that believeth on the Son of God has the witness in himself. He that believeth not God has made him a liar, because he believeth not the record that God gave of his Son. And this is the record, that God has given to us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. He that hath the Son hath life, and he that hath not the Son of God hath not life.
Well, we hope you have enjoyed our service so far, and we hope you were engaged in the Scripture reading. And uh, I know it's different, uh, us encouraging you to sing as families in your homes. And uh, it made me think of uh, something that I heard a few years ago when we were, as a pastoral staff, able to go to the Sing Conference. Uh, I remember uh, Keith Getty saying that when he and his wife, Kristen, have uh, had had their first child, uh, they asked Pastor John MacArthur for parenting advice. And, and it, his, his answer was surprising. He didn't go into, he didn't go into uh, uh, scripture memory or, or anything like that. He didn't go into any of the stereotypical advice that we give new parents. His advice for the Gettys uh, who write much of the modern hymnody that we use here at Grace Bible Church and and they've contributed a great deal to the church today. Uh, His advice to these two new parents was, fill your house with songs of the Lord. And so I encourage you during this time, uh, as we have opportunity to sing together, uh, for your kids to hear you sing, especially us us men, uh, then this is a great opportunity for us to sing as a family. And so I would encourage you to do that. I, I pray that you've been encouraged so far, and if you would go with me to John chapter 3, John chapter 3. We are going to finish the chapter today. Chapter 3 was much quicker than chapters 1 and 2. We only had two messages from the passage, uh, and next week we are going to uh, obviously start John 4, and uh, I'll just, from the very get-go, I'll just say that John chapter 4 is one of, if not my favorite text in the, in the whole Bible. It's certainly my favorite story of Jesus, favorite interaction uh, between Jesus and another person, and so I'm looking forward to that passage. And we have a wonderful and practical text before us this morning, so we are in John chapter 3. I, I'm going to do something today that I often, or that I, that I don't often do, but is not uncommon for me, and that's for the main idea of the passage, and so typically in an expository message, what we're endeavoring to do is to teach, is to state the main idea of the message as the main idea of the text. And so uh, that's what I endeavor to do uh, uh, every time I open the Word, and we may get there different ways, and we might, do, might use different tactics. But, but this morning, I'm just going to I'm just gonna lift the main idea right from the passage, and we are going to quote John. Uh, John the Baptist, for the main idea from our text this morning. But before we get into our text this morning, uh, and before we give you that main idea, I want to point out by way of introduction something that is so deeply human. It's something that we all do. We're, We're naturally so good at something, and it's not something to be good at. And that thing is that we tend to make things about ourselves, even good things. Uh, perhaps you've had a conversation with someone at some point, and you, uh, you, you, maybe you haven't seen them for a while, and you bump into them at the grocery store or whatever, uh, and, and they ask you how you're doing, and 
you have a, a conversation with them, it goes for a few minutes, and then you walk away from the conversation and you realize that you talked about yourself and your life and your circumstances for those entire few minutes and you never even ask them the return question, how are you doing? Maybe you've had that experience. We are in the stage in our home now that we have a, a toddler who, who processes pretty quickly and who thinks that she's pretty funny, uh, and that she has a younger brother who requires a different kind of attention, as he is only six months old, but requires attention. We are at the stage in our home where our daughter will very often say, Mommy, Daddy, look at me, look at me. And she may be doing something that she wants us to see and be impressed by, in which, of course, in which case, of course, we oblige. We want her to know that we're, we're proud of her. And so, uh, and so we enjoy those times. But sometimes what she's actually doing is she's saying, look at me, look at me, because she wants us to give her our fullest attention and not Leighton. She's actually attempting to draw our attention away from something that is necessary and important at that time. And that's something that we, we don't grow out of. Two-year-olds do it, but adults do it. We'll take good things and, and we'll make them about ourselves. We may come to church, and we may do service at church, and we may look over our shoulder to see who's paying attention to see if we're getting noticed. This is a temptation for all of us. And I want to just point out to you, as I said, from this passage, we're going to use this as our main idea this morning. I must decrease. We must decrease. And so if we look at our passage this morning, which we're, which we're about to, you will hear this phrase we must or I must decrease, and you will see who says it and why I'm presenting this idea to you. So let's read our passage together, starting in verse 22. We're going to read all the way down to verse 36. After this, Jesus and his disciples went into the Judean countryside, and he remained there with them, and he was baptizing. John also was baptizing at Anon near Salem, because water was plentiful there, and people were coming and being baptized, for John had not yet been put in prison. Now a discussion arose between some of John's disciples and a Jew over purification, and they came to John and said to him, Rabbi, he who was with you across the Jordan to whom you bore witness... Look, he is baptizing, and all are going to him. John answered, A person cannot receive even one thing unless it is given him from heaven. You yourselves bear witness that I said I am not the Christ, but I have been sent before him. The one who has the bride is the bridegroom. The friend of the bridegroom who stands and hears him rejoices greatly at the bridegroom's voice. Therefore, this joy of mine is now complete. He must increase, but I must decrease. He who comes from above is above all. He who is of the earth belongs to the earth and speaks in an earthly way. He who comes from heaven is above all, and he bears witness to what he has seen and heard, yet no one receives his testimony. Whoever receives his testimony sets his seal to this, that God is true. For he whom God has sent utters the words of God, for he gives the Spirit without measure. The Father loves the Son, has given all things into his hand. Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. Whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life. But the wrath of God remains on him. And you saw that phrase that I'm going to put before us as followers of Jesus today. He must increase, and I, and I'm going to apply it to all of us, we must decrease. Let's go to the Lord now and ask for his strength and blessing on this text. 
And after this, Jesus and his disciples went in the Judean countryside. And Lord, it is you that we we talk about this morning. It is you, Christ, doing these things that we just read that we get to talk about. And it's remarkable to us, Jesus, that you share this truth with us, that through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit and through the protection and preservation of the Scriptures, we can read about Jesus and his disciples going into a countryside. And we can know that it's true, and we can know that it has messages and truth for us. And so, Jesus, I ask that you would help us to see you in this passage to not be like the faulty followers, the, the confused and, 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 and jealous followers of John the Baptist, but to be followers, true followers of you who see you and recognize with John that we must decrease. And so, Lord Jesus, I ask that you would make us like you today. Spirit, I ask that you would help us to understand And God, I ask that you would be worshipped. In an empty room, save but two, worship must still take place. The word will still go forth, and it will accomplish its purposes. And for these things, we ask, God, that you would be lifted up, And we ask them in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. We must decrease. Why must we decrease? Well, that question is actually answered by John specifically here. And and of course, John the Baptist is, is speaking specifically of himself. And so there's direct application to who John the Baptist is, but there's general and broader application to who we are as disciples and followers of Jesus. So let's talk first together about John's joy, John's joy. And we see see this in verses 22 down to verse 30. Just to establish a little bit of context, obviously Jesus is continuing in his ministry. Uh, Remember that we got the idea that Jesus has been busy in ministry already. Uh, It doesn't necessarily, uh, just because he's only done one miracle recorded in the book of John, doesn't mean he's already, uh, uh, that's all he's done. Remember, it's assumed in uh, chapter 2, the end of verse 23, that uh, he's, uh, chapter 2, verses 23 down to verse 25, we, it's assumed that he has been doing ministry already, and he's been busy and continuing in probably healings and, and, and uh, teaching, as was the typical ministry of Jesus. And then we get into our text in verse 3, which introduces Nicodemus to us, and we have these kind of rich theological ideas introduced in chapter 3, the Holy Spirit, regeneration, redemption, the love of God. Uh, what, what do we have to do to get to God? What is the way to God? And then we have John the Baptist, another text about John the Baptist, which admittedly seems like an odd thing to do. I, for one, don't think that John was unintentional. I think what John the writer was doing is is purposeful here. And so let's ask the question, why transition from Nicodemus, who's confused, he doesn't understand, uh, it's, it's, it's not a positive interaction, to John the Baptist, who obviously is a positive character in relation to Christ, and and uh, this is, a, this is a, a positive example, a good interaction. Well, I think it's very simple what John is doing. I think he's presenting to us a way that we should respond to Christ and we should respond to the messages of Jesus as opposed to a bad response, which would be Nicodemus. And so I think it's a very simple idea what's going on. We have a contrast presented. Here's one way that we don't respond to Jesus in his relationship to God. Here's one way that we do respond to Jesus in his relationship to God. And so let's look together at at this positive example. John, starting in verse 22. After this, Jesus' disciples went into the Judean countryside, and he remained there with them, and he was baptizing. All right, so we've got Jesus baptizing. We've already seen the idea of baptism in the book. 
And we saw it in chapter 1, where John the, Bapti- John the Baptist baptizes Jesus Christ. So we, we already had this idea introduced to us. But now Jesus is doing it. First, Jesus was the recipient, and now he is the one baptizing. Or at least we know he's the one authorizing baptizing. It probably wouldn't have been uncommon for his disciples to be baptizing as well. Now, John had at verse 24, been put in prison, and he was also baptizing in the area. Okay, so we've got Jesus and his disciples, we've got John the Baptist and his disciples, and they're all uh, participating in this idea of baptism. And then we have a conflict that arises, keeping in mind that, uh, as we said several weeks ago, uh, baptism in, in Jewish thinking Uh, was closely associated with purification. It doesn't mean to them what it means to us as evangelical, uh, baptistic thinking believers. It had more the idea of cleansing, uh, spiritual cleansing, than necessarily an an identification uh, or the idea of buried with Christ, uh, risen with Christ. Uh, It wasn't so much a gospel picture. It was more the idea of ceremonial cleansing. And so, uh, but, but, but that's not the only conflict that we actually see in the passage. We get the idea that some of John the Baptist's disciples are rubbed the wrong way. And so we have this conflict over what John is doing, and then we have this conflict that, that comes up from John's, uh, John the Baptist's followers. Look with me at verse 26. And they came to John and said, Rabbi, he who was with you across the Jordan, to whom you bore witness... Look, he is baptizing, and all are going to him. So if you see in verse 26, uh, let's just point out some some details that actually show us there's a little bit of tension, okay? It's pretty pretty typical when we we experience tension to change our uh, our phraseology, not just uh, how we say things, our tone, but what we say, actually our content. And so look at me at verse 26. Rabbi, John the Baptist, so these are the followers of John the Baptist, addressing John the Baptist. They say to him, look, he who is with you is also baptizing. They don't say him by, they don't use his name. Now this probably would have been unusual. We know Jesus at this time was gathering a following. We know that there's a fair amount of, of, uh, of notoriety that Jesus was receiving. And so they certainly would have known who Jesus was. This was not just a, you know, that, that person, uh, you know, that person that maybe we do when we don't remember someone's name. This was an intentional usage or an intentional omission of Jesus' name. That one that was with you, that you baptized. Now he's baptizing. Now we can probably understand this. Maybe we, maybe, maybe we have someone in our life. I certainly have people in my life that I respect and that I follow. And if they're criticized, or if maybe if if I think that loyalty is shifting towards someone that I think deserves loyalty, I might let, I might get a little defensive for that person. Maybe you've experienced this as well. I think this is what's going on with the the followers of John the Baptist. And so we have this. We have this kind of this double conflict here in the passage. So there's some opposition to what John the Baptist is doing. Hey, what are you really doing here? How does this relate to purification? And John the Baptist's followers are saying, that man that you baptized, now he's claiming that he can baptize too, and he's got followers, and he's baptized. And look at what they say. And all are going to him. Now, we know that's not true. I actually think there's some frustrated exaggeration going on here. We all do this. Again, Maybe you've been in a conflict with someone, and let's just take these two things that are going on, and let's, let's, uh, let's analyze them from, from the perspective of maybe how you and I get heated, or what's, what's typical of conflict for us. What's typical of conflict for us is sometimes, maybe, maybe, maybe wives, you, you get annoyed with your husband. Okay, I know that never happens, but let's just say for the sake of argument that it does. You get annoyed with your husband, and you go and you talk to someone about it, which automatically is sin, so don't do that. But you might say, that man, he, can you believe that man? Rather than saying, can you believe 
George, or whatever your husband's name is. He, that man, always, and so now we're exaggerating. I'm not saying ladies are the only ones to do this. I'm just saying, for the sake of illustration, we all know what this is like. You're in an argument with someone, and you say, you always do this, or you never do this, or the first thing you always do or say is, and then we start using universal terms. That never works. See what I did there? It's, it's not going to work. That just, that just gets our blood going because we know that's not true. But we exaggerate out of frustration. We know this isn't true because in verse 23, it says that John is still baptizing. If everyone's going to Jesus, then John doesn't baptize because he's got no one to baptize. And so there's some tension here with John's followers. And John the Baptist, rather than... Rather than uh, agreeing. Yeah, I'm the guy here. I'm the important one here. I'm the one who's got followers. I came first. I baptized him. Now, why is he baptizing? John the Baptist gives some perspective here. John answered, verse 27, a person cannot receive even one thing unless it is given him from heaven. Now, what a way to respond to this frustration. What a thing to say. John the Baptist just gets right to the heart of the issue. He goes right to the bottom line. He doesn't say, he doesn't say hey, you know, you should think about this or this or whatever. He just gets right to the heart of it. He says, just remember in comparison, where Jesus came from versus where I came from. And so, in response to the frustration of John the Baptist's disciples, he says to his disciples, he points to the origin of Christ. Jesus is given to these people from heaven. And then he backtracks a little bit and he begins to, to specifically address and correct the issues of his own disciples. You yourselves bear witness, verse 28, that I said I am not the Christ, but I have sent, I've been sent before him. He says, you were there. You heard me say this. Did you not get what I was saying? I said Jesus was, was going to be the one. Verse 29. The one who has the bride is the bridegroom. Now we've got another uh, seemingly mysterious thing to say. But this is not mysterious. This is, this is a, a very purposeful uh, lesson and illustration that John the Baptist is using for us. And not only, not only, excuse me, is it purposeful in this text, we know that it's purposeful throughout the rest of Scripture. Through this picture of bride and bridegroom becomes very important. We've already talked about it in chapter 2. The one who has the bride is the bridegroom. They're the important people at a wedding. Who's not actually that important, even though they may be dressed up? The friend of the bridegroom. No one comes to a wedding, looks up at the wedding party, away from the bride and groom, and goes, you know what, those tuxedos, that, that guy in the tuxedo, he looks like the special one here. He looks like the one that's significant here. That's not the way it works. You go to a wedding, and you understand who is significant and why they're significant, but what role does the friend have? The friend of the bridegroom who stands and hears him rejoices greatly at the bridegroom's voice. I remember, so a little, I have an older brother, I don't know if you remember this about me, but I have an older brother. He's, uh, he's about 18 months older than me. Uh, he is married. They got two boys in Ohio. He's a police officer. My brother and I are very close. We were been best friends since we were we could be. And I remember my brother's wedding very specially. Uh, 
Now, one of the things, if, if you may have met my brother, he's been here a few times. Uh, one of the things that's just always been the dynamic between my brother and I, and I don't say this braggadociously, I just, I'm just, it's the way it is. It's, um, Drew was always the background guy, and I was always the, the, the opposite of that. And that was not necessarily intentional. It's not that I wanted to out. Uh, it's not that I, I wanted to, to, to show my brother up or whatever. I, I just, our personalities lend themselves that way. Drew's quiet and he's content to be so. I'm not. You can take that whatever way you want, but that's just, it's not our personalities. And so Drew tends to be more reserved. He, he, he talks to you if he has to, and he's kind, but he's not going to, he, he's just not the outgoing type. And I tend to be a little more that way. It's not that he's unkind, he's just, that way. And so on, on, the, on the wedding day, something that very much growing up in our childhood, it happened on the wedding day that, that didn't happen very much growing up. I, I, and I, I probably need to work on this. But I, I, tend, to, I tend to just kind of take over where I am. And, and that's not always a good thing. Drew was the one that shined on his wedding day. And I loved it. It was awesome. I was so happy for my brother. I was so happy looking out into the crowd and seeing people look at my brother and look at his bride, and the looks on their faces, that brought me such joy. I was so pleased with this. There was not an ounce of me going, you know what, I wish people would look at me right now. I really want people to see me. Never occurred to me. My brother and his bride they were significant, and they shone. They stood out in that crowd. And not only was I okay with it, I loved it. And that's what John the Baptist is saying here. No good friend of a bride, bridegroom wants, wants the attention. He's happy for the bridegroom. And he's happy for the bride. Therefore, verse 29, this joy of mine is now complete. Later on in the book of John, Jesus is going to say this. I have come that your joy may be full. And so John actually, John the Baptist experiences that right here. John the Baptist knows his place in relation to Jesus Christ. And his place in relation to Jesus, to Jesus Christ, which is not significant, it's to be the less significant one, brings him joy. So what John the Baptist is saying, I see people going to them, I, or to, to, to Christ. I look around, I see my followers are thinning, I see Jesus is getting more followers, and more people, are, there's more interest in Christ, and it brings me joy. He must increase. I must decrease. And so what John the Baptist is literally saying here is, here's how I derive my joy. I derive my joy when people look at Jesus and the attention is on Christ. And so essentially, John the Baptist's response to his followers is, this is exactly what's supposed to be happening and it brings me joy. He must increase. I must decrease. He must go forth. I must be silent. He must be visible. I must be invisible. People must run to him and away from me. He must increase. I must decrease. Now listen. Listen. 
There's a very, very simple baseline application here. Do you receive joy from being seen or from Christ being seen through you? Here's what we do. We we live our life the best that we can. We want to have the best job so that we can have the nicest things. So when people see us, we look good. Looks like our lives are together. It looks like we're spiritual people. We come to church when we need to. We, we give whatever, and, and, and we kind of hope secretly that people are noticing that we give. We serve as eye pleasers, which Paul warns about in Colossians 3. And we do things so that we are seen. And we think that being seen and being recognized and being noticed for all the good things that we do, we think that will bring us pleasure. When what John is saying is, if you live so that through your life, Christ is the most obvious thing about you. That is where you get joy. You will only have joy by decreasing in your life and Christ increasing in your life. But what we want to do is want to increase ourselves. Our bank accounts, our toys in the driveway, the beauty of our house. We want people to think our kids are great. We want the most gifted one in the field, the most gifted one in the band. We want to increase. You say, I don't have this problem. That's great. But I would warn you against that. You say, why? I have interacted with many proud people in my life. I interact with myself all the time. But I've also had the privilege of interacting with many humble ones. And you know, the most humble people that I know see this danger in themselves. And they, they're aware of it and they fight it. They don't have this spirit that I don't have this problem. Because this problem is is, is not just an individual problem, it's a human problem. We've always made things about ourselves. So how do you know that? The very first humans to ever exist did this. What is Satan's temptation? You will be like God. How awesome would that be? He wants to hide his greatness. He wants to be the only one who's great. And if you do this, you can be great too. And Satan taps into this fallen, this this human instinct to be great, to be unique, to be significant. You say, I don't have this problem. If you don't see this problem in yourself, you probably don't see the other problems that you have as well. We all want to be seen in some way. And maybe it's not general. Maybe it's not lots of things. Maybe it's just one thing. Maybe it's the thing in which you're most talented. We give our gifts so that people can recognize how they're given rather than just giving our gifts because it's our spiritual worship. Let's all pray that the Lord would, 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 would peel back the layers and show us in what areas we want to increase. Because where we are attempting to increase, the world through our lives will not see Christ increase. Now, Christ will increase because that's what he does. Christ is going to be glorified, but he may not, you may not be the instrument 
through which and in which He is being praised and he is increasing because you want to increase and you want to be praised. God, help us from, keep us from this. Protect us from this. Protect me from this. The desire to be seen is completely and fundamentally antithetical. That is the opposite of why we exist, which is to bring glory to God. And if we want to be seen, if we live our lives holding the magnifying glass up to ourselves, hoping that people notice, we're shining it away from Christ. And people don't need to see us. They need to see Jesus in us. They need to see Jesus through us. So I I just really don't feel joyful. I mean, Christians talk about joy. Is it possible that you're living your life for the approval and the pleasure and the recognition of other people and you're not getting enough pat on the backs and so you feel frustrated? You live that way, I promise you, you won't have joy. And I know that very simply from this passage. We live our life like it's a painting. In an art gallery. And we get everyone in our life, we get everyone that we know to come to this art gallery. Because we say that we're in it. And we draw everyone's attention to the painting, and in the painting is a very obvious portrait of Jesus in the foreground, and we're in the background, up in the very top corner, and we've got our heads turned, and we come and we get everyone to go, hey, look at me, look at me, I'm right there. And we cause people to miss what's obvious. God keep us from this. John John the Baptist continues his explanation. He actually goes back to the idea of the source again. So he introduces the idea from where Jesus came. Heaven, heaven has given us Christ. A person cannot receive even one thing unless it is given him from heaven. So Jesus is from heaven. Heaven gives us Christ or God gives us Christ. So let's look secondly together at heaven's hope. Heaven's hope. Hope, And we find this in verses 31 down to verse 36. I'm going to give you three ideas from these texts now regarding who is the hope, and that hope is obviously Jesus. So let's look together at verse 33. We'll read, read these few verses. He who comes from above is above all, so that he is Christ. He who, who is of the earth belongs to the earth and speaks in an earthly way. He who comes from heaven is above all. All. So let's look together at the superiority of Christ. The superiority of Christ. Heaven's hope. The source of our hope is Christ, and Christ or is heaven, and Christ is that hope. So God has sent this hope to us, which is Christ. And so now we're given some descriptions about what this hope is or who this hope is. He who comes from above is above all. So he, Christ, who came from above, heaven, is above all. He's superior to all things. He who is of the earth belongs to the earth and speaks in an earthly way. So there's a contrast between you and I, we who are earth people, earth dwellers. This is where we came from. And Christ, who came from heaven to earth, and he comes from heaven to to earth as God, and reigns earth. He is above all. And so secondly, let's look together at the certainty of Christ. The certainty of Christ. He who, or excuse me, verse 32, he bears witness to what he has seen and heard, yet no one receives his testimony. Whoever receives his testimony sets his seal to this, that God is true. For he whom God has sent utters the words of God, for he gives the Spirit without measure. So he whom God has sent, so again, 
the source of Jesus. Where does Jesus come from? Jesus comes from heaven. Jesus comes from God. God, heaven, has sent Jesus to us to be our superior Christ. He's, he's above all things. And there's certainty in him. You know what to believe and you have something to believe. There's security in your system of faith if you believe in Jesus. If you place your faith in Christ, you have security in both your heart because we believe with our heart and in our minds and how we process because we must choose something intellectually. The world wants something to believe. The world wants some sort of secure system of thinking. And it's not Christianity that is the answer to our mind's questions. It is Christ on whom we form the basis of Christianity. And thirdly, we find as a part of this hope the salvation of Christ. The salvation of Christ. Now, obviously, I understand I'm talking about Christ is the one being saved. It's the the salvation that Christ provides for us. The Father loves the Son and has given all things into His hand. Now, so, so, so look at what happens here. Look at what happens. Heaven gives us Christ, right? He who comes from above is above all. So heaven gives us Christ. God provides us for us, Jesus, for us, Jesus Christ. But the Father gives Christ certain things. The Father loves the Son and has given all things into His hands. If we understand John chapter 1, which we've already spent a great deal of time. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. He made all things. that Without Him was not anything made that was made. And so back to this idea, even again, of superiority in verse 35. Jesus is above all things because Christ, because God the Father has given Christ all things. Verse 36, whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. Whoever does not believe in the Son. Excuse me, actually, I'm going to say that again because I want to make sure you get the right words. He who does not obey the Son shall not see life. But the wrath of God remains on him. So now let's just speak by way of application through these three ideas. The superiority of Christ. I want to just say very briefly on this idea that Jesus doesn't need you to reign over your life. He already does. Sometimes we, we use phrases like, just, just let Jesus handle this. Let, let Jesus be the king. Just let Jesus. Jesus doesn't need to let you do anything. Jesus already is sovereign. And so our response needs to be of obedience and submission. I don't give God, I don't give Christ, excuse me, I don't give Jesus Christ permission to reign me. He already does. I, as a follower of Jesus, whom God has given me, submit to him and, 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 and fall down before his reign. But so often what I do is I attempt to live my life independently and I want to be above all things and I want things in my hands and so I attempt to take control and I want to increase. These two ideas are obviously closely connected. The way that we avoid attempting to increase in our life is to submit to the already present and the ever-present sovereign rule of Christ in our life. The certainty of Christ. The world needs someone, needs something right now to hope in, to believe in. We bear witness, he bears witness to what he has seen and heard, yet no one receives his testimony. Now, now look at this in the context of verse 31. He comes from heaven. 
what you and I see is earthly, what you and I process is earthly because we're earthly people. But he's from heaven. So what does he bear witness of? He bears witness of heavenly things, yet we don't believe him. Except for those whom he's drawn by his grace for his purposes and who confess and believe. For he whom God has sent utters the words of God. Remember we said from chapter 1, the idea that Jesus being the word is the primary way in which God communicates and expresses himself. The primary and ultimate expression of God is Jesus. That's what John 1 teaches us. And so now we've, we've specified that kind of expression of God into the spoken words of Jesus. For he whom God has sent utters the words of God. Jesus says the words of God. Why? Don't forget the purpose of the book of John. To prove to us that Jesus is God. And if Jesus is God, then he can die for you and he can save you. And the reason that Jesus can utter the words of God and does utter the words of God is because he is God. And so if you rest and place your belief in the Son of God who is God, you place your belief in the only true certainty, in the only real security. The only true constant. Thirdly, let's look together at the salvation of Christ. Third and finally, the Father loves the Son and has given all things into His hand. Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. Whoever believes. Now, John has just made a statement that no one receives his testimony. This is probably specifically reject, a reference to those who would reject Christ, specifically the Jews. But obviously we know that, that you can believe because John says that, that we should, right? Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. This word believe is constant in the book. Because these things were written, these signs were included in this book, that you might believe that Jesus is the Son of God, and that by believing in Him, you might have life. Belief is the primary human choice in our relation to God through Christ. Did you hear what I said? Belief or rejection is the primary issue in our access to God through Christ. Whoever does not obey, and I think actually what John is John the Baptist is doing here is even specifying even further, whoever does not obey the Son by believing, who does not obey in his belief, you say, where do you get that? I actually get that from passages in the Old Testament which, uh, which tell us that the, 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 the people of Israel committed this sin of unbelief. The writer of Hebrews in chapter 4 talked about this a great deal. There was a sin that separated them from God, and that sin was lack of believing. And so I think the way that we come to God is by obeying the call to believe. And what happens if we don't? We will not see life. And notice this terminology. But the wrath of God remains on him. Remains. Here's why we use that terminology. Because for all those who haven't yet believed, the wrath of God was already on them. And the only way that wrath is removed is if through Christ there's belief 
and repentance. And Christ removes that wrath through his sacrifice because he has this opportunity. He has, through the accomplishment of his gospel work, his cross work, since God has given all things into his hand, Christ can remove, only through Christ is that wrath removed. So there are people all around us on whom the wrath of God remains. Who need to obey and come to Christ. Submit to the superior and certain Christ who saves. And what happens when that takes place? What happens after salvation? We have the whole gamut here. We have all the whole spectrum We have a a believer's perspective, John the Baptist, a follower's perspective. Then we have this warning of wrath. If you come to Christ, you submit to Christ, whom God has sent us from heaven, and the wrath of God is removed, and so now you rest in righteousness and you live freely, and you experience that mercy, you have complete joy available to you. Complete joy that looks like verse 29. And how does this happen? What takes place when you become a believer is not only does your eternity change and your soul changes, but your priorities and your perspectives and the mission and goal and the existence of your life changes. So now you no longer say, I must decrease, but increase. You say, I must decrease, and Christ must increase. And when this happens from my life, I have joy. If joy is missing from your life, you might just be living not for the wrong things, but for the wrong person. Because those who come to Christ fundamentally say, he must increase, I must decrease. And if we live our entire life attempting to live the alternative of that, flip those things so that I'm increasing and he's decreasing, we will naturally be unhappy because we're not functioning the way God intended believers to function. So now we're doing two things if we're attempting to live our life increasing and Christ decreasing. We're robbing ourselves of joy and we're failing to give God the glory, which, by the way, is failure altogether. He must increase. We must decrease. And so, In what area of your life, what issue of your life do you want people to see you? Let's take those things to Christ and and confess and ask that he would show himself powerful through our life. I'm in this process in my life where not only am I desiring that the Lord would do this, in my heart and in my life that he would cause me to decrease. He would give me a heart that wants to be invisible. But I'm actually, and I'm not that old, but I'm starting to see the joy of seeing other people outshine me. I love when my, I, I, I love when my kids seem happy. I love when people gravitate to my family and they bless my children. That brings me such joy. When people joke about our lives that, you know, people put up with me so they can get Julia, I I agree with that. I believe it. That's awesome. It's true. If we live our life 
wanting to be invisible and Christ increasing and us decreasing, there is a joy that outshines any kind of earthly pleasure that we can work to attain by living for ourselves. He must increase and we must decrease. So let's make this a thing. It wouldn't be weird if Christians said, like, let's decrease together. Are you decreasing? I need to decrease. You need to decrease too. Let's all decrease together. Let's decrease together. Let's pray. Christ, we ask that you would give us strength to increase from our lives. And to do this, tear down our pride so that we decrease. We ask these things in your name. And for your praise, amen.